Hello everyone, welcome to Conf42 Site Reliability Engineering. My name is Ricardo Castro and today we're going to talk about alerting on SLOs and what are error budget policies and how we can leverage them. So what do we have on the menu? For starters, we're going to set up some context. So we're going to talk about SLOs. SLOs are all about reliability. So it's easier if we have some ground uh, knowledge to actually build on top of these concepts of reliability and then talk about alerts and effort budget policies. We'll then talk about some reliability concepts. So we're going to talk about SLOs, but we need to talk about all the things that encompass SLOs. So we need to talk about the foundation uh, that gives us SLOs. We need to talk about metrics and SLIs, and we will then uh, talk about accompanying uh, concepts like error budget and SLAs. We'll then get to the good part where we are going to talk about how we can alert on uh, SLOs and what are error budget policies and how can we leverage them. And at the end, we're just going to conclude on why all of this is important. So let's start by setting some context to our discussion. An example from the real world that we can uh, think of and draw a parallel to our, um, to our reality is an, a supermarket. So if, if we think a little bit about it, a supermarket is kind of a microservices architecture. So the idea is that me as a user go into a supermarket, I do my shopping and I go out. What happens in reality is that there are many, many things that happen underneath the covers that make it possible for me to do this transaction. So for me as a user, I just want to go in, select the things that I want, I pay and I get out. But that means that there is a cashier to register everything and receive payment. That means there are people that get stuff from the warehouse and put stuff available for me to do my shopping. There's also people that need to put orders so to ensure that stuff gets at the supermarket. There's people that do the unloading from front trucks to inside the supermarket. There's butchers, there's people that work on the fisher stand. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on underneath the covers that actually make it possible that I can do this transaction. So like a microservice, I interact with, with an application and that means there are uh, maybe a lot of uh, services that are working together to provide the functionality that are required. So, what does that mean exactly to be reliable? Let's still look at this example of a, um, of a supermarket. So I did my shopping, I want to pay. Why, how can this action might not be reliable? So if it's taking too long to pay, if I have to stay half an, half an hour on a queue just to be able to pay, I might consider that this service is not being reliable. One other aspect, for example, is when I go into, uh, to pick up some product, if the product expiration date has passed, I might say that this service is not being reliable. And we can draw a quick parallel between this reality and the reality of the tech world uh, by saying that uh, an analogous concept to, for taking too long to pay is that, late, is that of latency, where a request, for example, takes, takes too long to be served, and a product expiration date uh, being passed might mean an error. So this wasn't supposed to happen. So going a bit further on, uh, on what reliability means and looking at our reality more into the tech side. So I work at a company called Anova and at uh, Anova we work in industrial IoT service. So we provide services to our customers. We have, these numbers are a little bit outdated, but we have more than 2000 customers worldwide. We operate in more than 80 countries and we monitor more than 1 million assets. So what we do is that we get data from industrial sensors, we process them, we store them, and then we apply things like machine learning and uh, AI the, and build applications that allow our uh, customers to actually provide ser good service to their customers. And this means that we need a way and a framework to actually ensure that uh, our systems are being reliable. And ideally, we want to be alerted when something 
uh, is not being reliable enough. So, what does reliability mean exactly? If you look at the dictionary, uh, the Cambridge Dictionary in this example, we can see a definition that says that the quality of being able to be trusted or believed because of working or behaving well. So, in essence, this means that something is reliable if it's behaving well. And this is a bit rough, so I like the definition from Alex Hidalgo's book, Implementing Service Level Objectives, actually a better way to define reliability. So, in essence, what uh, Alex, Alex says is that reliability can be defined by our users. So, the answer to the question, is my service being reliable, is, is my service doing what its users needed to do? So, if we look at reliability from the point of view of our users, if they are satisfied, my service is being reliable. So, how can you actually measure this? And now, let's start our discussion about the, con the founding concepts that will actually lead us to SLOs and the other, the other concepts. And the most fundamental concept is the concept of the metric. And the metric is nothing more than the measurement about something in my system. So, if an event, an event happens and I take a measurement on that. So, let's imagine a few examples that we have here. So, the amount of memory that the server is using. The time it takes for an HTTP request to be fulfilled. So, for example, in milliseconds. The number of HTTP responses that are an error. Or how old the message is when it arrives at a Kafka cluster. So these are just measurements. An event happens and we take some kind of measurement about that event. Building on top of metrics, we have the concept of an SLI. And an SLI is a quantifiable measure of service reliability. So an SLI is go what's going to allow us to say that uh, if a measurement is actually good or bad, or an event is good or bad. But how can we define that? So we need to achieve a binary state even if the metric itself doesn't give the, gives us that out of the box. So, here are a few examples of how can we, we can define an SLI. So, we can say that requests to a service need to be responded within 200 milliseconds. So, this means it's if I serve a request, I can measure how long it took. If it was more than 200 milliseconds, I can say that it wasn't a good event. If it was 200 milliseconds or less, I can say that it was a good event. And analogous, we can say that if a response uh, got a 500 error code, it is not good. If it got another code, it is actually a good event. And the same thing for Kafka messages. If the Kafka message that arrived is older than 5 minutes, we might say that it's not a good event. If it's younger than 5 minutes, it is actually a good event. Building on top of SLIs, we have the concept of SLOs. And SLOs actually define how many times an SLI needs to be uh, actually be good so that my users are happy. And that needs to be time bound. So here are a few examples. We can say that 99% of requests to a service need to be responded within 200 milliseconds within a 30 day period. Same, the same way we can say that 95% of requests to a service need to be responded with a code that is different than 500 within a seven day period. And same thing, 99.99% of messages arriving at the, at the Kafka cluster must not be older than five minutes within a 24 hour period. So essentially what an SLO gives us is a way that within a time bound, I can say how many times my SLI needs to be achieved so that my users are not unhappy. So what exactly what, what is exactly an error budget? An error budget is nothing more than what is left from, um, from my SLO. So if I consider 100% and I remove the, um, the, the, what is the SLO, I get my, SL, my, uh, my error budget. So if I have an SLO of 99%, I can say that I have 1% of um, error budget. So it's ex effectively the percentage of reliability left and it helps us make us educated decisions on whether, for example, to release a new feature or not. We're going to see that in a bit. And of course, they make the operability process, for instance, incident response, to have an appropriate budget so, to, for us to know what we need to do. And last but not least, the last concept is the concept of an SLI that most of us um, are already familiar with. So when we 
um, sign, for example, for a, a sign up for a service. Let's imagine that we sign up for a cloud provider like Amazon or AWS or whatever cloud provider we are, you are using. They all usually provide us with an SLA. So what does what the, what is an SLA? It's usually a commitment between a service provider and the client. But in practice. Uh, SLAs are nothing more than, a, than, a, than, a, than an SLO that has consequences when that SLO is not met. So here are examples of what an SLA can say can be. So if I can say that 99% of requests to a service need to be responded within 200 milliseconds within a 30-day period. If that doesn't happen, so if the SLA is not met, the client will get a 30% discount. Same way, we can say that 90% of requests to a service must be responded with a code different from 500 within a seven day period. If not, the client can get a 50% of its money back. And last but not least, we can say that 99% of messages arriving at a Kafka cluster must not be older than five minutes within a 20, 24 hour period. If not, we can be fined um, for 100,000 euros. SLOs, uh, SLA, SLAs are usually looser than SLOs so that we, we know when an SLO is broken, we still have some buffer to actually fix things before an SLA is actually broken. But that means that we need a way to actually know if an SLO is at risk or not. And of course, we can put that in a visualization. We can, um, we can create uh, some graphs that we, we can look at and we can see uh, what, are the, what is the SLO, what is the objective that we are um, trying to achieve. In this case, it's 99%. Uh, 99%. If we are or not bur burning uh, error budget, how, many, uh, how much error budget I, still, I, I have left uh, for, uh, for the period. So visualization is a nice way for me to understand uh, if an SLO is at risk or not. But we would ideally be alerted, right? So we don't want to stay um, our whole day of work looking at, this, um, at these charts. And even worse, if something happens during the night that is going to put my, uh, my services at risk, I need to be alerted. So this is where alerting on SLOs comes to. So traditionally, we did metric thresholds. So what we would do is that we would send an alert if some threshold about a metric um, is, uh, is, <clears throat> is met. So we can say that if a CPU goes above 80%, I want to receive an, an alert. If a request takes more than 200 milliseconds, I want to receive an alert. An alert. If an error, uh, if a request is served with a 500 error, I will receive an alert. And same thing for a Kafka message. Of course, all of these can be combined and I can receive an alert um, and receive a, an alert if a combination of these things happen. So we can take the same approach with SLOs. So we can say that if we uh, can, we can say that if the latency threshold goes below 99%, which is my target, I can receive uh, an alert. And we can say the, the same thing for an error rate that achieves the 99, 95% and I receive an alert. So this is similar to what some of us had already been doing because we could say like, okay, if I want uh, X amount of requests to be more than uh, uh, 200 milliseconds, we receive an alert. So this is good. This is better than the actually the, uh, the the metric threshold. But I would only receive an alert when I'm already in trouble. So if I define the 99% as the threshold where my users are happy, if I go below that, I, well, basically what I'm saying is that my users aren't happy. So ideally, what I would want to, is to be alerted before this happens. And if we are relying on this to fix things before an SLA is breached, this is ex exactly what we want. So how can we improve on this? So we actually can improve on how much error budget I have available or how much error budget has been burned. So the idea is that I will trigger an alert when the ab available error budget reaches a critical level or when an amount of, um, of error budget has already been, uh, been burned. We can actually set different levels and trigger different messages, uh, messages to different channels. So I can say, for example, if that if I have burned 25% of my error budget, I can send an email to my team. If half of it has been burned, I can put a message on Teams. And if, for example, 75% of the error budget has already been burned, I want to send a message to PagerDuty and I want to tell the team that needs to do something immediately. 
This is better than the solution that we have before, but at this point we have no clue about how fast the error budget is being consumed. So a question actually can arise. If by the end of the evaluation period we would still have some error budget left, would I would like to receive this alert, for example, on PagerDuty? Probably not, because if we consider that we are still within the bounds of what my users consider, consider to be reliable, I wouldn't want to be wake, woken up by 3 a.m. in the morning to fix something that is actually not being to, need to, to be fixed. But yet, we still don't have a clue about how fast my error budget is being consumed. And this means that maybe I received an alert uh, that 75% uh, of the error budget has been burned, but it's burning uh, so fast that it's actually we're going to get in trouble. So if we think about it, we can actually alert on burn rate. So basically alerting on burn rate tells us uh, how fast the error budget is being consumed. When we have a burn rate of 1, this essentially means that if we are burning rate at this at a constant pace and the burn rate is 1, at the end of my period, the periods that we've seen uh, previously, like 30 days, 1 week, 24 hours, I will have burned all my error budget. Here's an example. For the window of evaluation of, for example, 4 weeks, an alert if, uh, I, uh, an alert if the burn rate reaches 2. Why do I, would I want this? Because this would mean that with a burn rate of 2, which is the double of what um, is the maximum uh, burn rate that I want, would mean that I will consume all my error budget in half the time. So for a period of 4 weeks, if I'm um, consuming, if my burn rate is 2, would mean that I, after 2 weeks I will have no error budget left. So I would want to receive an alert. This is also, this is also better, but this has one slight issue. Which is that if the burn rate is too high, it might not be picked up. For example, if we evaluate the, error, uh, the burn rate every hour, but the error budget is all consumed within 30 minutes, we won't receive, we would receive no alert. So the last evolution of our alerting on SLOs is the multi-window, multi-burn rate alerts. So this is the idea where we will combine the uh, previous alert that we've seen using multiple windows. And we what we want is to alert on fast burn when the, the, the burn rate is too high and that will alert us on sudden changes, something that actually catastrophic event that happened and it's consuming stuff really, really fast. But at the same time, we also want slow burn, uh, slow burn rates. We want something that's consuming our, um, our error bird budget consistently over a longer period of time, we also want to alert on those. So here are a few examples. So for fast burn, we could say that for a period of two windows, in periods of five minutes, if the burn rate reaches 10, we want to receive an alert. So this would actually alert us if we've had like a spike uh, on our error budget consumption. And we will have a similar one, but that would be slower. So for a 20, we would evaluate a 24 hour period, um, window for uh, every five minutes, if the burn rate reaches two, we would receive an alert. So this is an evolution where we can go from metric thresholds to uh, thresholds on alerts to actually have something that we can say, say with some confidence that when we receive an alert, uh, we actually need to do something. But what is that something? And that something can be defined on the error budget policy. So the error budget policy determines the alerting thresholds and the actions to take to ensure that the error budget depletion is addressed. So what does this mean? The error budget policy is actually it's a policy that is defined beforehand where we say that if X action happens, we will take the um, action A, B and C. So here are a few examples and I'm going to see a document more detailed in a, in a second. So we can say that if the service has exceeded its error budget for the preceding four-week window, we will halt all changes on our service and releases and we will only do P0 issue or security fixes until the service is within the SLO. Depending upon the cause of the SLO miss, the team may devote additional resources to working on reliability instead of feature work. So basically here what we are defining is a concrete measure for if the error budget has been depleted um, at some point within our four-week period, we will not be releasing uh, features apart from, of course, P0 issues or security fixes. 
And we're also saying that depending on what, on what caused the, SL, the SLO to be missed, we might need to add additional resources to work on reliability instead of releasing more features. Another example could be that if a single incident consumes more than 20% of our error budget over the same four-week period, then the team must conduct a post-mortem. And that post-mortem must have at least one P0 action. So a P0 action would be something that is really urgent. So again, this actually defines the actions that are going to be made when the error budget policy is at risk or has been consumed. So this should actually go into documents, uh, agreed with multiple parts, so that everyone is on the same page regarding um, what is being done when the SLO is actually consumed. And taken from the Google book, uh, the SRE uh, Google book from the SRE book from Google, we have an example of such kind of document. This is just an example. You can of course define your error budget policy the way any way that you want, but this gives you a good starting point into how to define an error budget policy. So here in this example, we see that we have the authors of the error budget policy, when it was when it was defined, who reviewed it, who approved it, when it was approved, and when should it should be revised. We then have a service of review, so it will be the service or group of service that this error budget policy applies. We would then have the goals and non-goals. So this, these are the goals that the error budget policy tries to achieve and what are not the goals that it's trying to achieve. Then we have a definition of what it means to actually miss um, the SLO. So here's a detailed description that what does it mean to um, for the SLO to be missed and basically means when will the when this error budget policy will be enforced. We we'll, can also have other sections like an outage policy, an escalation policy, and some background that it is necessary. So to quickly sum up all the concepts that, that we have seen, we started with metrics. With metrics, we can um, build SLIs, and SLIs is what will, have, will help us define if a metric is good or bad within our context. An SLO is how many times an SLI needs to be achieved so that we can be sure that our uh, users are happy with our services. An error budget is the amount of um, reliability that is left uh, from the SLO. And with SLOs and error budget, we can build visualizations that are good, but ideally what we want is to actually be alerted when the, our error but on our SLO is at risk. And of course, SL alerts can um, uh, trigger an error budget policy. For example, if I'm consuming too much of my, of my SLO, I can enforce an error budget policy that has been pre-discussed um, pre and agreed with all parties. And of course, we have the concept of an SLA, which is an SLO with penalties. But why is all of this important? This is important because this way we can define reliability in the eyes of our users. We stopped measuring, um, we stop, uh, stop alerting and defining reliability to something that doesn't really um, is defined by our users. So I don't want to be alerted when I have an, uh, a threshold of a CPU, for example, going up at um, three in the morning and my users are not being uh, affected. This, of course, ties in into reducing alert fatigue. So now I will receive, ideally, I would receive alerts only when my users are being affected or they are at risk of being affected. Of course, this also creates a shared language to talk about reliability. So now with, the, with all of this, we have a framework in place that can actually tell us if our systems are being reliable or not and it, it's understood by everyone. And of course, it facilitates prioritization. So we have a way to say to see if we're being reliable or not. And of, um, we have an error budget policy that actually can help us define when more work needs to be put on top of reliability. And before I go, I want to leave uh, a shameless plug. I'm writing a book on overcoming SRE anti-patterns, uh, anti and we will we'll have a couple of um, a chapters in the book uh, speaking precisely about this, speaking about how to measure reliability in the eyes of our users and how we can leverage um, alerts on SLOs and um, error budget policies to actually improve our day-to-day -day operations. And this is all uh, from my part. I hope you enjoyed and this talk was informative for all of you. You can find me at, um, at, the, at these links. Thank you very much and have a great day.